Good evening, thank you so much for attending to this roundtable, this conference. So I will not uh, repeat the, the name of uh, all the participants, but the name of the, um, the sponsors, the partners of the event. Just to mention that the event formed part of a series of other scientific activities in the frame of a project funded by the National uh, French uh, Agency of Research, the, it's uh, an INR, we call it. It's called uh, Sustain Asia. It gathers five laboratories across all Asia. And uh, the different partners are the Center for Social Development Studies, CSDS, represented here by Mr. Carl Middleton. Uh, we have also, um, also from Chulalongkorn University, the Chulalongkorn University UNESCO Chair in Resource Governance and Futures Literacy. Um, we have also the Institute of Political Science from Toulouse in France, it's called Sciences Po. And finally, the Heinrich Böll Foundation from Germany, represented here by our colleague and friend, Franz Tarnoli. Um, and of course, IRASEC is pleased to uh, co-sponsor this event. So, I will call one by one all our uh, presenters. Before, just let me uh, tell you that the session is being recorded. It will be uh, on Facebook, in a Facebook Live, and also it will be uploaded after the event on our YouTube channel. So the people who were not able to come here will have the possibility to explore further what has been shared uh, later on the internet. So first I will call uh, Mrs. Uh, Catherine Baron. It's called here. Catherine Baron is a uh, 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 professor at Sciences Po Toulouse. Then I have the honor to call Karen Delfo, who is a PhD candidate at Sciences Po Toulouse under the supervision of Catherine Baron. We then have Dr. Anindria Nastiti from Institute Technology Bandung in Indonesia. Our colleague Dr. Apisom Intralawan from the Institute for the Study of Natural Resource Management and Environmental Management at Mefar Luang University. And finally, our colleague Fong Huin, Deputy Project Manager at, uh, from GRET in Laos, it's an, uh, an NGO. Tonight uh, we will address different questions regarding uh, water governance, um, the comments, related to water and also the participatory approach. So first question that I will address to all of you, maybe beginning with uh, Professor Catherine Baron, is to provide a brief introduction of your work and uh, to connect it with uh, commons and the concept of commoning. So how do you use the, the word, the concept of commons and commoning? And uh, is it something uh, important to understand what uh, governance in your fieldwork? So only few minutes of introduction before we enter in a, in a bit. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good evening, everyone. Sorry, I'm a little bit tired because of jet lag and of the full day workshop, which was a very intensive and very rich workshop. So um, I'm Catherine Baron. I'm a uh, an economist, social economist, working on, uh, in institutional economics. I'm uh, saying that because uh, I have been working on the commons for a very long time, uh, with a first approach, as many of uh, institutional economists, reading the works of Elinor Ostrom, who is very famous because she got the Nobel Prize, which is not a Nobel Prize, but the prize of the Bank of Sweden in economics and uh, she had the Nobel Prize for her work on the commons. So we all started to read the book of Oxfam, uh, which was interesting because uh, she wrote at a period where we were wondering what is, um, well, facing the failure of the market concerning water governance. 
regarding the failure of public governance concerning water issues, what is the alternative to these two extremes uh, that we can consider? So our work was very interesting to analyze how another way of thinking governance was possible uh, from the grassroots organizations. What was very interesting in the work of Ostrom was that she documented a huge amount of examples of community uh, organization governing their water resources in a sustainable way. So we were all very, you know, interested by this work. And I was working in Africa, in fact, on water governance, and a lot of her work was on, in African context also. So I found it very interesting at the beginning. And then, the most I read this uh, work, the most I read on the commons, and the most I realized that this approach was interesting at the first step, but uh, it needed to be uh, analyzed more deeply and maybe in a more criticized way. Just one way I started to criticize the work of Ostrom was about the concept of communities. She was all the time talking about communities as a kind of homogeneous uh, organization. And working with anthropologists, I realized that she escaped a lot of problematics and she was like selling a new model, which was kind of idealistic. And I didn't find on my fieldwork all the you know, power relationships that structure, in fact, communities, organizations. So I started to have a more criticized reading of uh, the literature on the commons and uh, going to a more political analysis of the commons. So I will tell more after. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Karen Delfo, and I'm a fourth year PhD student. <laughs> I can't believe it's already the fourth year. Uh, my topic is really looking at knowledge co-creation and co-production, and how that can be used as a mechanism for bringing women's voices, marginalized voices, and a broader sense of social inclusion into water governance. Where are the opportunities for different types of knowledge commonly invisible knowledge or knowledge that doesn't fit within the paradigms that we traditionally look at as knowledge. The commons is something that's relatively new to me, um, but there is a lot of overlap and intersection uh, in the work that I do with, with the commons. Um, in particular, interested in the issues of power. Um, some of my work, in addition to being a student, is uh, around supporting the, the, the process of inclusion, in particular gender inclusion. So what are the rooted networks that exist within the commons and how are those relationships, how are those dynamics of the, those relationships, how do they develop and how do they play out within the commons as a system? Those are the questions that really interest me. Thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is Anindria and uh, like previously mentioned that I'm from Institute of Technology Bandung. Uh, well, it surprised me that I'm invited here because I'm coming from a very hardcore engineering uh, faculty. Even, uh, uh, even that was the first engineering uh, working on the civil uh, side in Indonesia and we are, uh, we used to, uh, all the knowledge were coming from the Netherlands before. and. But since like 2011, I think I've dedicated myself to work in interdisciplinary research. And uh, since then, I've been working around water, especially in water supply and sanitation uh, system. So just reflecting what we had, that we have discussed today, uh, we acknowledge that comments are, uh, can be both uh, resources and it can be both services. So I think in this uh, in this issue in the context of Indonesia, what interests me is that the intersection and tension between the two. Uh, uh, later, uh, I will introduce uh, uh, the water resource that can be both as resource and both as a service that has to be provided. So I'm looking to uh, dig deep into uh, the relationship between uh, those two concepts of a uh, common as resource and also common as uh, services. Thank you. 
Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Apison Intralawan. I'm from Mephalong University, Chiang Rai Province, Thailand. Uh, I uh, had a training in ecological economics. Uh, so common and commoning is uh, a new term for me, but uh, basically uh, my research are looking at the intersection of water, energy, land, and livelihood. And because of Chiang Rai, uh, the northernmost province uh, located uh, nearby Myanmar and then Laos on the Mekong River. So my research, uh, past research and current research are always working on the com uh, commons, which is water, energy, food, and land. Right? So, but I'm going to explain uh, on uh, using an uh, ecological economics lens uh, what I'm going to uh, about the, the research that I'm working with uh, Thailand and Myanmar, and I will tell you a little bit later. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Fong. I am, uh, as my accent tells you, I'm American working in Laos, which is a one-party state. So that's the context that, that we're, we're coming from. Uh, I work for GRIT, and uh, in GRIT, uh, we had uh, with an experience working supporting uh, the forestry sector in Huo Pan, which is the you know the the home of Pathet Lao's Lao communism, and when we were working, uh, we were fortunate. We had a ten year experience supporting the communities there. We uh, we realized that in order to to, to really facilitate the communities' uh, ownership and also uh, linking them to policy makers, we needed to, to uh, play a role of facilitating this, uh, this collective decision-making, collective analysis process from the communities, which, and at the same time, we had to support it, the, the national government, the, the policy makers, in allowing the, the discussion and perspectives from communities to, to contribute to their own reflections and we realized that as, as we were going through this 10 years that, uh, and we, you know, we received, uh, you know, there was starting to be very critical analysis by the communities on their own uh, management of their own forest resources. And when we reflect on this, we realized that this was the commons-based approach. And based on this, uh, we, we started developing what we call a commons program. It's a multi-country, multi-project uh, pro uh, program that start to analyze throughout uh, very different projects what approaches are we doing and what approaches, uh, what can we synthesize from that so that we can develop with, uh, with communities and with the commoners a more inclusive, more com what we call common-based approach that then allows us to pilot it in, uh, in other projects. Right, and also to start uh, you know, raising awareness, instigating critical analysis by you know, policy makers, by donors, by everybody, of this potential. And uh, in, in this program, one of uh, the pilot uh, projects that we, uh, we start to, to support is, the, is called uh, the Wetland, it's, it's a WISE project, which is a Wetland Improvement in Lombobang. Lombang is a World Heritage City, and to give you context, is that in, in that city, there's a lot of ponds that are pri privately and publicly owned, but they're all, uh, they have a governance system that is designed and, and break it, supposedly regulated by the government because it's part of the World Heritage Site, and so there's the, 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 the government's World Heritage uh, Office, they determine the regulations of how to manage these ponds. And by doing so, but unfortunately, they, there is not much consultation with the communities, with the you know, with the the owners of the ponds of how they should they, they should uh, regulate it and how they should manage it. Secondly, is that they don't even their own policy they don't enforce it. So, what ended up happening was that these ponds uh, there's no ownership by these on these ponds. So the ponds started, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of pollution, there's a lot of misuse of the ponds, there's backfilling. And 
when uh, when Greg, you know, we we had this project and we we uh, had a discussions with the communities and we had uh, what we call you know the catch term participatory tools, but it's more for us it's like these interesting uh, games you know we call the serious games or territory games, what that allows engagement with the village uh, and the communities to for them to to assess what are priorities that they want support. What uh, and then from the actions, what what kind of governance structure they think fits for them, and from that, our role as facilitator of this process is to then help them concretely identify how to design this uh, you know this uh, this structure and uh, the different priorities and how they will govern themselves with the idea that again you know we're I know we like to use the word commons and common base approach a lot. But when it's related on a, you know, on a facilitator uh, point of view, is that these, no matter how you name them, right, it's, it's more a collective, we keep on saying, collective shared governance practices that, that allows the communities to critically analyze and critically uh, decide for themselves and develop their own governance structure. And it just happens, as we call it, the commons, you know, common pay approach. Thank you so much for addressing your different approaches um, in such a concise manner. So you have noticed that we have uh, people from academia, from uh, NGOs, and uh, almost everyone uh, at, the, at the crossroads between different uh, worlds and different, different <coughs> approaches. So it's, a, it's really rich and uh, it will enable us to address a second question, which is a fundamental uh, question, um, which is, do you think that commoning uh, enables both the fulfillment of basic human needs, let's say drinking water, for, for instance, and the long-term protection of ecosystem, of environment? So does it enable to combine these two uh, different fields? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, just five minutes, yeah. Um, in fact, this question is related to what uh, Alindria mentioned, uh, which is quite strange for the academy point of view, that very often we discuss about uh, governing water resources on one side and service governance on the other side. And very often these two words do not communicate which is quite strange, especially for people working on the field, because they see all the time that the two are connected. But the issue is to uh, try to understand, okay, basic needs, the access to drinking water, it's a right, it's a fundamental right, it's a human right. And it must be, uh, if we put a kind of hierarchy, it's a one of the fundamental um, need. But at the same time, there is this issue, which is a more and more important issue of water resource protection, preservation. So the, the issue, which is not that easy to deal with, is how do you address the issue of the access to drinkable water for everyone under the constraint of preserving water resources? And how do you combine both of them. What is interesting is in SDG, the way they were formulated at the first step, it's very strange, they put the two in the, in the SDG 6, saying that you have to get access for all the people, but you have also to protect the resources. So the, you know, all, so all the debates on the nexus approach, so service and resources. And then when it finally uh, was discussed at the end, at the very end, they skipped <coughs> the uh, environmental part, which is very interesting also. So why? So there are big political um, um, dilemma between, in the discourses at least, and also on the field, between these two big issues. So maybe uh, an Andrea. Sustainable Development Goals, right? SDG. Oh, sorry. Yes, Sustainable Development Goals. Sorry. Yes, thank you. So actually, uh, in my point of view, that question is very pragmatic. I mean, like, it's 
really reflect what happens in the field, especially in the context of Indonesia. Uh, the most obvious example is uh, the fact that Indonesia only targets 30% of people to be served by municipal piped water centralized system. It means that the rest 70% will depend on other sources, which is mostly groundwater. And uh, uh, in the context of urban area, the issue of groundwater depletion in, uh, in terms of quantity and quality is really uh, rising at the moment. So, uh, if so, there is a, a clear, uh, a clear contradiction uh, between whether we should prioritize uh, giving access to people or preserving that that falling groundwater access. And of course, uh, in in terms of uh, natural science and engineering perspective, those are correlated. I mean, if we don't preserve that, there will be no access to people. But it's just a matter of uh, where, where do we start first? And that because, uh, like like you said, it's a basic rights and we cannot wait for people not to get water. So that's a, a very urgent uh, issue in, in urban area. And if we look at the way we govern the commons, uh, the groundwater at the moment, it's very technocratic. I mean, uh, in Indonesia and, and, and also in perhaps in many other parts of the world, the rule of thumb of governing, governing something is that if you cannot see it, if you cannot measure it, you can manage it, you cannot manage it. And the, the issue with groundwater is the invisibility of the problems. It's deep in the ground, so it's really difficult to, to know whether uh, it's depleted right at the moment, uh, how much is it at the moment, so, uh, so the the invisibility of the problem making it difficult to to manage it. So, I think in Indonesia uh, they even do not have a very holistic view of uh, they they have a certain uh, estimates about how many left and then what should we do about it. And they do many things to preserve it by, for example, applying. Uh, licensing, uh, economic incentives to, to to preserve it, and so many things. But in terms of trying to see the efficacy of the measures, it's been a challenging issue. Maybe that's from my point of view. Is there another reaction? If not, um, Maybe I can add something. Yes, please. And Indria and I were working also on these off-grid systems, which means that in many cities all around the world, in Africa, in Asia, and uh, in Latin America also, you know, um, in big cities, we know now that the centralized network, as it is uh, in the Western countries, is not a model anymore. In many cities, it will not be the, the system that will provide water for all the urban dwellers. So there are, has been all these new models as the, what we call off-grid systems. And these off-grid systems are small networks, for, insta for instance, that provide water to poor people in poor informal urban areas. But very often, okay, they get access to the people to water, but they do not, do not include, as you said, the issue of groundwater. Where does the water come from? How do we preserve this kind of water? So these urban models, in fact, uh, raise a lot of new problems, new issues. And so I think it's very interesting to look at this kind of uh, issue very carefully these days. Thank you. Can, can I share a bit uh, about my case? If it, even though it's not about drinking water per se, but it's about uh, water-related hazard. Uh, I'm from Chiang Rai, right, uh, the northernmost province in Thailand. We share the border with Myanmar in Tajile, you know. And uh, there is one chair river called Sai River uh, that acts as a borderline uh, between Thailand and Myanmar. And every year, uh, 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 two countries are facing with flooding, like a flash flood, you know, like, like for example, this year, Masai and Tajile already has flooded three times. Uh, uh, before doing this project, uh, there is a dispute over the water uh, allocations. Uh, Myanmar uh, uh, 
remove the weir that the farmers uh, has done for a long time, you know, to divert the water into their farmland from this international Chair River, right? And Myanmar blame uh, Thai farmers that this is causing flooding on their sites, right? And then uh, the Thai farmers uh, went to the the gate, uh, closing the gate, so the, the, the training between two countries stops. You know, so this lead to the tragedy of the commons, right? Everyone are going to suffer from from uh, the, the competition over the water. So uh, I had this project uh, came from ONWR and funded by our MC. So uh, first thing that we did is to frame it, the problem that uh, from the blaming games, right? Like who caused what, whatever. But we are trying to communicate with uh, uh, Myanmar people that this is a common problem because when they are flooded, it's not flood only on Thai side. We are both suffer from flooding. So this is a common problem that <coughs> need common solutions. So uh, we uh, 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 form the team uh, because water and flooding has a multi-dimension. So we have a hydrology team, we have the land use and remote sensing team. We have the socio-economic team that assessing water security, which has five dimensions, including uh, drinking water and, uh, and disaster uh, water. Uh, we also have a policy team. Uh, that is one thing. And we also are uh, working at the multiple scale because water, uh, a commoning of water can be at the national level, at the regional level and also at the community level. So we have team uh, across cutting issue teams, uh, horizontal team, and also vertical in integration team working on multiple level. And after we uh, uh, co-create uh, the knowledge by uh, collecting data, uh, assess uh, the water security on both sides, uh, you know, uh, then we help uh, disseminate the result. And at the end, we are uh, developing the applications, uh, warning applications, uh, you know, uh, two languages in Thai and also in Myanmar. And also we have a chat box uh, that uh, the upstream people can notify the downstream uh, people that uh, the water are very high now and there are possibility of flooding. So I think this is uh, turning the competition over the water into the common or commons problem. I think this is one of the examples, even though we, I'm not using the term commons because I'm from another field, you know, but I think this is fit well with what Professor just explained about commoning. Right. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, when, when, when we work with, uh, you know, water quality or ensuring the water, the available water resources for the communities, for the common nursery. Right? Um, a lot of time, yes, focusing on that, sometimes you forget the environment, you were saying environmental factor, but if you think about it, environment, you know, by ensuring that the, the, the communities understand <laughs> their management of the water resources, uh, influence or impact their long-term use of these resources and they understand this idea and they actually they 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 they, they see the linkage between that and their own uh, you know day-to-day -day life they we notice in Loma Bang they start to analyze and they start to see that uh, how they manage these resources ensure better uh, in a way, better environmental, uh, you know, and ecological the system, uh, ecosystem that they are inside, and in a way, indirectly, without you know, with them, without them thinking, because a lot of times, as as projects or you know whatever, and you think like, okay, what is your environmental uh, impact, right? Because your donors ask that, but when when you when you instigate this critical analysis by the commoners, and they 
they internalize that and they start to see the linkage of if I manage my resources well, the water resources well, I have my own, you know, economic but more, uh, you know, the daily life benefits. That by itself uh, motivate them to be more environmentally, you know, uh, environmentally sound, you know, in the way they use that resources. Right. Yes, very interesting. Uh, I would like to um, to add a question. So the audience has, has a more concrete idea of uh, how water is governed at different scales. Do you have? Uh, can you provide some examples of how local, regional, national, even international states can interact, interconnect in the regulation of uh, of water? Uh, you have examples in mind of how it is negotiated, articulated, and so on. So I, I think when we, we speak about commoning uh, and we speak about governance, we're talking about this mechanism of co-governance. I think that's a really critical piece of it. Uh, and I, I think the, the work that's been described so far really reflects that. Uh, the piece I'd like to kind of discuss is how, how voices that normally, that do have knowledge that are normally not included in that governance um, at all levels really uh, is, is incorporated through this, this, this way of approaching it through the commons um, and through the mechanisms of co-governance that are being developed. So, Traditionally, a lot of times, and particularly in terms of local access, we don't always have the opportunity to set up decision-making mechanisms where underprivileged you can say women's voices, minority voices, have a space to be able to participate. Um, and I think this co-governance emphasis is a way of rethinking that and providing a space, providing an emphasis on getting those voices into that process. Um, the Commons allows us to reevaluate how these different levels of governance are structured, how they are set up uh, from the community level up through the higher levels of governance, and it opens up a space for inquiry that doesn't always exist in other forms of governance or, or sort of frameworks of governance that we work with. That co-governance element uh, is critical, so just to frame the conversation. And I'll, I'll give you an example, actually, if it's all on this, is like um, in Laos, which is uh, very, uh, you know, authoritarian in a, in a way, and they're, they're pretty top-down as policymakers as far as how, uh, how their policies uh, dictate, you know, natural resource use, because a lot of times the government uh, consider land, forest, water as uh, you know, belonging to the state, and by using, uh, you know, the, by fostering the idea of the you know, in the, at the village scale, uh, that uh, you know, by collectively deciding and kind of collectively managing the resource, they are they are less anti-state, but they're they're more uh, they're con contributing toward the state. By, because if they're governing their natural resources, the state doesn't have to worry about this. And when when the local government recognizes this, and it takes some time, you know, for this dynamic to start, and, and you have to, you know, as facilitator of the process, you bring, you create this space, you know, you try to build this dialogue between the communities and local government, so that they uh, they start to exchange, and the local government start to recognize that, hey, you know. This is not this is not something that threatens us. It's actually, this actually uh, make make us you know, we have less work. We have uh, to worry uh, less resources. And then at the same time, at a national level, you continue to support you know this national dialogue, creating again space there where we you know where you support the, you know getting the voice from the village and local government. To contribute to the policymakers' perspective, and by by doing this, you're you're again instigating their thinking that they realize that okay, maybe this this uh, you know having a shared governance is 
a good thing for us because as long as they don't threaten the state, you know, they are actually supporting uh, how we, we have to govern, the, you know, ensure there's natural resource management and sustainable natural resources, right? And so th this is where the, 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 the experience from the village translates to more uh, policy dialogue at a local level that feeds into the national level where the policymakers slowly start to think of like, okay, maybe we need to legitimize that in our own policy. And they, you know, and in Laos we have tried to, we, we've done that with the 4C track sector, and now we are engaging on the, you know, on the water sector. Where again, you know, and in Lombabang, and we noticed this. In Lombabang we have, uh, where in the beginning, when we first, I remember the first conversation I had with a Lombabang government officials, they were very concerned. They said, well, shared governance. You know, governance belongs to the state. It's like, no, no, but this is shared governance of the natural resources, of the wetlands. And there is, there, uh, you don't have to worry about this. Because it's a work that you have to worry less and you still have input. And after uh, one, one and a half year, you can start seeing their orientation where they say, well, you know, this, this process actually works. So, Okay, uh, and, and they, uh, like, uh, for example, we, we help uh, develop, facilitate, uh, develop uh, a uh, management committee, which is by the communities. And at the beginning, the government was very concerned, and now they said, well, you know, we, we want to facilitate this process. So we, we start to see that this common base approach that we apply does, uh, you know, can work across different sectors. And so then, you know, the idea is, again, it's very important, is creating that space. You know, I think we mentioned creating that dialogue space because without that, you know, and you have to play again. Uh, we had a discussion today about facilitators. As facilitators, you have to instigate the process, promote the process, and then you step back and let you know. You'll be amazed at the communities and the government how they will continue the process. Can I just follow up on that? Thank you for illustrating that through that example. Um, I just want to follow up on that, just talking about the way that things have been done, how the way that governance is structured sort of across the board. We have these models of participation that have been put out. We were saying, you know, we want, we want participation. We want you to come and attend, but listen to us because we're the experts and we're going to be talking about, you know, what needs to happen in terms of governance. And then you have some <coughs> consultation. Well, maybe we're going to ask you a few questions. Maybe we're going to get some data out of you. That's really helpful, but then you start to have deeper and deeper levels of concentration. And what we're really trying to push for is this co-creation of governance, which is a whole different thing. It's not just, let's do a little bit of focus groups, let's extract some knowledge, let's take what we need, and let's build something with that and see you guys later, because we're making the decisions over there. No, we want to bring you into the decision-making, and we want to take the decision-making to you. So it's, it's a really a different, deeper way of thinking about engagement, and it's, it's emerging as a real opportunity because what we've been saying for the last 40 years, well, we still have problems, don't we? Um, maybe we need a new way of thinking and we need a new approach. And, and that's why I think this is really potentially um, transformative and quite exciting. Okay, let, let me share a bit about Thailand and Myanmar uh, issues. Uh, uh, we have an existing uh, mechanism for governing the border they call a township uh, border committee. But in the past, uh, it's more like a conflict resolution mechanism. Like when, when two countries have dispute over the border, they often discuss and consult each other. So in the past, they are always looking at the uh, traditional security issues, right? Uh, but uh, nowadays, like we are become urbanized and also uh, facing with the climate change, uh, you know, extreme weather. So uh, our project uh, bringing uh, non-traditional issues, uh, non-traditional security issues like water issue into the discussion among the two countries, you know, but um, what we also found that uh, governing uh, governance of river, you know, there are multiple scale, right? Uh, there is official uh, mechanism between the two countries. Uh, but uh, what is most effective is at the local scale, the informal mechanism between people and people. 
right? Like, like for example, that we are co-creating applications that are being used by the two countries to notify whether uh, it's going to be flood, any possibility of flooding. You know? And I think because of these two countries are sharing culture, language, you know, uh, it's more, it's faster. I mean, you know, people to the people connection is relationship. When, when this uh, relationship is established, you know, uh, it's, it's faster than uh, the official uh, mechanism. I mean, but let's see what's going to happen in the long run. Maybe we will have a co plan, co management plan of this river together in the future that we are hopeful. Thank you. Uh, allow me to ask a last question before opening the, uh, to the floor. So, um, you, um, we expect when we talk about comments like uh, an egalitarian uh, reflection, uh, decision taken in, um, through egalitarian deliberation, and uh, sometimes we avoid the potential conflictuality, as it was mentioned in the introduction by uh, Catherine, uh, the negotiations and the social hierarchies. So when you meet, uh, when you encounter a social context with, where everything is blocked because of competition, internal uh, conflict or difficulties linked to uh, hierarchies, how do you proceed? What, what are your strategies as a facilitator? Okay, so I think uh, the most important thing, uh, when I reflect back to the cases in Indonesia where you find uh, blockages or you, you just stop in, in the beginning, uh, you, you have to reflect back, do you have the same goals for everyone in the, uh, uh, in the system, in the, in the equation? Because sometimes uh, some goals are universally agreed upon, like like providing safe water, it's definitely uh, universally agreed upon that you don't want people to be sick uh, to, to be sick from the public health perspective. But some other goals are less so. So uh, it's uh, maybe it's a tension between again three pillars of sustainability: is it economic interest or social interest, uh, social equality or environmental interest? So I think that's the first thing that we have to make the goals clear for everyone and so we can try to co-plan, co-create, co-design strategies uh, to develop in the future. In fact, I think it's a very difficult question. <laughs> Maybe the most difficult question because when you arrive somewhere in a village, for instance, I'm going to speak about Africa because uh, I don't know the Thai context, but there is a lot of hierarchy. You have a structure of the society in some parts of Africa, which is very, um, you have a chief, he formulates the rules of the water, of the land, and there is this system which exists. And then you arrive, you are an NGO, or you are an academic, and you say, okay, so we have to have participation, we have to have shared governance, we have to have everyone equal, and uh, women have to be part of the discussion and per people minorities have to be part of the but who are you to decide that the rules are these rules based on uh, egalitarianism so i think it's a very difficult question because uh, okay we are talking about the comments that's what i was why i was criticizing uh, ostrom works for for instance and i find it extremely complicated to arrive somewhere and just to say, okay, we have to get organized this way because we think that this way is the most efficient one to protect the resource, to have access for all. But in fact, we don't consider that maybe people want to have their hierarchy system and that they don't want to change it. So, you know, we're talking about the dynamic of change this morning, but dynamic of change, what kind of change? Why do you decide that democracy, I, I, I know I can, it can be shocking what I'm going to say, but how do you decide that democracy is the best way for all the people everywhere? It's a very tough question, and I don't have any answer. 
and I'm an academic, so I feel much safer than NGOs. You know, it's much comfortable. <laughs> And it's true because you know, as facilitator of the process, you uh, you oftentimes uh, become very narrow-minded and you know linear and directional. And when you have these blockages, a lot of times you immediately revert back to your development training, your you know the the, the approaches you've been used for a long time, and you forget the fact that you are using an alternative method because the old way doesn't work. But so, how do, you, how do you address blockages? Well, you have to remind, remind yourself, I mean, this is the perspective that uh, Red, Red takes uh, you know, to, in the comments, is that you have, to, you have to reflect back that the comments is for collective decision by the communities. What does that mean then when there's a blockage? You go back to the communities so that the communities, we, you know, facilitated by us, they, they, we ask them, what is blocking? Maybe for them it's not a blockage. Yes, for you maybe, you know, because you have all these indicators and everything you need to fit. But maybe for them, say, like, hey, this, this works for us. I mean, I, uh, I'll tell you, it's an interesting, uh, it, it, interesting story, but it's related to force, not for the, the water. Is uh, we have, for a long time, uh, the development has used what we call participatory, participatory land use planning, right? And it's, it's popular everywhere, GIZ, everybody does it. And recently I did, uh, was part of a study, and when we interview a lot of uh, communities that has the uh, and the, the ideas, the impact on these methods, which is supposed to be participatory, right? On their, the, uh, the community sense of land tenureship. And it was, there were some villages where they express and say, you know, we have a customary way of doing it. And we managed that for hundreds of years. So this method, for us, not so useful. Yeah. And, and so it goes back, you know, and it goes back uh, in the, 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 the district and some, you know, some organizations, they were saying, well, what does this village apply? Plug? And, and they said, well, it doesn't work for us. But they felt threatened because, you know, they are being imposed to try plug. So the analysis is sometimes, and we have to re remind, and, and you know, I remind our team all the time, is that you have to remember that what you determine is a blockage, maybe it's not their blockage. So you have to go back to the communities and work together collectively. So you, know, you don't assess, because a lot of time we do, you know, project do assessment. It should be they who assess for themselves, so that they can analyze and think and say, okay, is this a blockage? If it's not, then okay, then we have, even though we believe it's a blockage, we step out. Secondly, if they think it's a blockage, what are their solutions? Because maybe they have some idea solutions that fits with their social, you know, cultural, uh, you know, situation where they are. And then, if they are not sure how to solve, then they will say, okay, what kind of support do you think you would need from us? Right? And then we engage them on this. So I think when you're addressing a facilitator role in blockages, it goes back to the, com it goes back to the communities. Yeah, um, in my case, yeah, hierarchy exists, especially at the official and bureaucratic system, right? Uh, so uh, to avoid that, uh, you know, we are also working in different dimensions. Like if the political blockage we are working on the cultural dimension because like we share river we share <coughs> culture we share prosperity and then you know like at the community level we feel like uh, we, we experience that there are less uh, hierarchy and, and blockage you know so we try everywhere every scale every dimension of mechanism of uh, governing the river Uh, in research, I think about positionality, you know? You come in, you have a bit of a research agenda. You want to fill in the boxes, in a sense, and you have to sometimes step back and be like, hang on a second, maybe I'm asking the wrong questions, or maybe I just need to sit and listen, instead of pushing my agenda. So it's that, that process, and, and this is something um, particularly in feminist political ecology that we always go back to, is that reflection process. Take a step back, take another step back. Wait, take another step back and think about it again. Um, and listen, 
you know? How do we become better listeners through this process? It's a big question, too. Well, thank you so much. Without transition, I will uh, give the, the microphone to the floor. If there is any reaction from the audience, uh, please ask your questions, your remarks, your critics. <laughs> I have a question. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Robert Owen from University of Melbourne in Australia. Is the, is the level of groundwater sustain or extraction of groundwater sustainable? How, if not, how is that going to be managed in the future? In terms of in, in Indonesian context, uh, uh, the way that uh, groundwater has to be recharged and, dis and recharged again, the pace is not keep uh, cannot keep up with the way it is extracted at the moment. So we can say that it is unsustainably managed at the moment. So uh, in the future, there are many directions uh, in the context of ur urban area, uh, directions towards this ideal notion of sustainable urban water management. And one of the strategies is to do a, a hybridization of water sources. It means that uh, we try to reduce the use of groundwater by so many things, like maybe uh, using surface water and reclaim water. That's the new recent trend. Like in Singapore, they with the new water program, they managed to uh, do uh, to to utilize this reclaimed water. It means that you reuse water from wastewater and then use it for another uh, purposes in the domestic and commercial settings. But of course, if we think about that, we will be challenged with many aspects, not to mention not only technological aspects, but also political, sociological, and also uh, public acceptance of these different sources. So even if technologies now manage to solve the problem by providing new ways of water, not only groundwater, we still we will still be doing what we call as a sanitation marketing. It means that making people switching to uh, new alternative water sources. Yeah, but we try to see that in the future, but yeah, that's a big challenge in the water sector. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the generous uh, contributions. Um, I just I had a very broad question, uh, more about um, Chinese dams upstream, um, also just Chinese-led um, support of this um, transition into sustain sustainable hydroelectricity in the region, and how that is related to developments in transboundary governance, and um, and also of course. LMC being involved and things like that. I'm just curious if you can comment on your respective contexts. Please, if you have any, any answer, any... No, that's it. We'd like to defer to... Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Carl Middleton. I'm director of the Center for Social Development Studies at Sherlock University. So just to make sure I get the question correct. So China's upstream dams and impact on downstream, claims of sustainability and the general role in the region. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, really big and big and well, important questions. Um, so I guess um, it's difficult to say that there is such a thing as sustainable hydropower would probably be an opening point of the discussion. Um, even though these types of projects have been claimed as being some form of like, sustainable solution to energy. Um, I guess for the upstream dams, some of the really, like the earlier important discussions were about the way in which the projects were first designed and built as essentially a unilateral um, construction. So not really a consultation with downstream countries. Then more recently, with as you mentioned, like the Land Chamber Reform Cooperation, there's been questions of how a kind of regional integration program might bring those projects into some form of collaboration with downstream. Um, 
that program until now has been relatively opaque, I would say. Not really m much open to public scrutiny or accountability. Um, so there's been kind of flashpoint periods of time, especially at times of drought, about the role in which these, the roles in which these projects have played in creating downstream low flows. And that's, I guess, become highly geopoliticized as well, um, with some of the studies that have um, come from the US um, that have used satellite data to uh, claim evidence of withholding water upstream. Um, so, look, I guess, like, looking forward, like, there is more intergovernmental cooperation nowadays between China and the downstream governments, between, like, the LMC and the Mekong River Commission, but how that is translating into, like, meaningful changes for communities along the river on the ground, I think, is a far more important question that's not really being addressed at the moment at that level. The extent to which governments are cooperating are mainly around um, like producing hydrological, hydrological studies to kind of understand how the river is changing. But really what's important is questions of accountability of the way in which projects are being operated upstream for people that live alongside the river downstream. Um, you know, so I think that's kind of the current state of this issue. Perhaps to discuss more, either now or later. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Tarnadi. Thank you. Very rich discussion and also different perspective. I really enjoyed. Francisco Tarnadi, uh, manager research communication and dialogue and specific to Southeast Asia. Uh, since this is live stream, so I try to navigate my way, you know, because some government are, let's say, cannot take criticism. Um, I want to ask you know, all the panelists about uh, water and energy. Ajana Pison mentioned about this tragedy of commons. Um, from my work, I observed that there is this disconnection between commitment and policy. Let's say, uh, to, to good example, a country, a city-state in this region uh, uh, advanced in the green technology, renewable energy. However, this year in August, bought uh, 100 megawatt uh, electricity from this power uh, integration project from a battery of the region. So, this this paradox, that's one. Number two, recently I went to another downstream country where the water so low, so dry, until they face a sudden intrusion from the sea. Then the farmer lose all the, the crops. They have to give up the third crops because it's just too salty. They cannot uh, grow the crops and they lost their income. <laughs> and remember, we just passed this COVID-19. It's like, it's like a nightmare, but it happened, right? And then the funny thing about this country uh, they listen to the, con the concern of the people, the government say they will uh, handle this thing, they join the regional organization, Yeah, how, how to negotiate about that. However, at the same time, a state-owned company signed a deal, 1.7 billion US dollar, to invest in the dam in the World Heritage site. So, like, my question is that how to bridge this, this connection? I mean, like, I believe they are not that, you know, they, they know, yeah, right? But how to bring this awareness to the policymaker that uh, profit is not about all, it's, it's not all about money right now. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I can speak a bit about my uh, past paper on the trade-off between water, energy, and food. You know, so uh, in that paper, we look at uh, the, the planned dams in the lower Mekong countries, not in the upper reach of, of the Mekong. So uh, you mentioned about the, the new that's about to build dam, right? So um, we look at the trade-off. Uh, like, of course, uh, dam bring electricity that uh, everyone needed, right? But also dam has a social and ecological impacts. So at the policy level, they have to uh, kind of weight between the benefit and the cost. You know, um, and also looking at the alternatives, uh, especially like nowadays, like um, solar and 
other source of renewable energy are cheaper than that. Right? That is more and more expensive because construction costs and also uh, social and environmental costs are increasing. You know, uh, but other technology are kind of uh, less cost, uh, more, more less ex expensive and more competitive. So um, yeah. So maybe the policymaker has to think about not only about uh, you know, uh, getting more uh, energy security, but also uh, what at what cost. And I, I think this. I, I think this goes back to the the power dynamic we discussed today in our in our workshop. Is in this case, uh, you know, in uh, in the Mekong region. You have the MRC, the Mekong River Commission, and their mandate actually to support the, the various Mekong countries to 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 analyze the, the dams, whether the dams should be built, make assessments, and then uh, and then based on those multi-stakeholder assessments uh, and feasibility to see whether the dams will have social, you know, e ecological impact and. And it, although all the member states in the Mekong region sign on to this MRC to say that, okay, we will listen to you once you do this multi stakeholder assessment, at the end of the day, what happens is once you have uh, you know, very big companies that have linkages to very powerful geopolitical entities, right? It's, there's not much they can do. Even though there have been cases where dams, you know, I, I can speak from the perspective in Laos. There's many uh, Laos, you know, the Sayaburi Dam, you know, where they, you know, the assessment and, and uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, environmentalists and everything, they did their own assessments. WWF does this, and they, they said, you know, your assessment uh, doesn't really match with you know, our own assessment. And, but, and even MRC sometimes when they do at the end of the assessment, they say, well, you know, we're not sure of the ecological impact. So we're, we, we, we recommend waiting period, right? But at the end, the state, you know, having all this even, you know, economic pressure and also geopolitical pressure, because these entities that are, they, they can spend billions of dollars, there are somebody behind them, right, who can push through this and in a, in a country like Laos, you know, where they, they can say, okay, uh, maybe we don't need to wait. And they, they initiate a process of them building anyways. So it goes back to like, how do you mitigate this, uh, this effect? It is very hard unless you have, you have uh, a geopolitical will to counteract this. And a lot of times, especially now in the social economic environment that Southeast Asia finds itself in, I, you know, I'm, maybe I'm a very cynical uh, guy. It's hard, actually, to midi to to counteract this very powerful uh, influence. Okay, so uh, can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, can I add something about this the issue of energy and water nexus? I don't have the answer to your question about how we navigate these two nexus, but uh, also we have to realize that. In the bigger picture, the, the main issue in the energy sector is also how they can become zero emission. So in that way, uh, in, in their perspective, investing to hydropowers is making more sense uh, if, you, if you think about trying to reduce the emissions. But of course, in the other way around that, there are a social and ecological impacts coming from the hydropower. So it's a tough uh, question and it's also it's a tough trade-off as well. Uh, I do have a question, but just want to um, share some thought on that question in terms of this connection between commitment and policy. Perhaps, you know, this kind of uh, commitment on the, to ensure the participatory of local community, community empowerment can be the hope in order to make that connection. But my, my, my question is on, because we discuss a lot in terms of you know, intervention from outside, whether it's CSO or academic community, in order to ensure the, you know, governance or co-creation of some kind of 
uh, end up linked space in order to solve certain problems. I'm curious, what is the balance? What is the good balance of intervention? If you believe in science, for example, the, uh, the uh, um, global warming to go not beyond 1.5 in the next decades, if you believe in science, that doesn't matter, right? So that, that's where you need to involve the local community or inclusively everyone. But we see local community is the most uh, uh, disempowered group of people that we need to wake up to do something about it. So that's why intervention is needed. How we can be a good listener that are useful, right? And so, so yeah, this is a, a, a question. By the way, I'm I'm uh, Odom from Cambodia, the uh, Water Government Policy Coordinator, based in Cambodia, from Oslo. Thank you. Is there any reaction? So I. It's, COVID actually put us in a really interesting situation because where before I was able to access the field, all of a sudden, for over two years, I could not. Well, how do I continue with my projects? I think there's a tremendous opportunity to tap into our networks and work with local researchers who are trusted in these communities to support this work and to create more of a local network of experts um, and empower them. I have certain skills. I can write grants, you know, I can, I can do theoretical research, I can put the papers together, I can do the reporting, I can do all the project management side of things. But man, my colleagues are so much better. They're conversant in the languages and they can go and they're trusted and they have these networks. How can we empower these lower, lo local actors more and more to go in and play these roles? I think that this is, an, this is a tremendous opportunity and I feel like COVID gave us a new insight on how to approach this. Uh, it forced us to, we could go into the field anymore, but we need more of that. We need to change the way that we think about collaboration and empower local actors to do this kind of work. Because I think that, you know, they know, they know the networks that are in place, the relationships that exist, that have existed, the dynamic shifts that are constantly taking, they know this, it's in their bones already. Um, this is harder for me to co come into local communities that you know I've met a couple times, uh, some link to. I don't speak the language, uh, so I, we need to rethink and empower people to be able to be those actors on the ground and to be a part of this process more than I think we have been doing pre-COVID in particular. And, and it's it's interesting, you know, in uh, in development work we like to use the word empower and capacity building. And, uh, you know, I agree with you in the, in the sense that, uh, you know, when, the, you know, during COVID, and you have to work from home and everything, and we have a lot of CSO in Laos who are, are continue to work at the, at the village level. And then when we, when we re-engage with them in, in, in a more direct basis, I realize that, you know, the word empowerment is wrong. I think it's more, they have that, they, they have that inherent, uh, you know, capability already. They have a lot of times they do, they know what is needed at the community level. And our role actually is only to, to say, okay, how do we mobilize this? How do we encourage this so that and, and support, you know, in our sense, support them to be able to contribute and be, have space inside, you know, inside a bigger national dialogue, a provincial dialogue. Because a lot of times, you know, they're, you know, the, because of development sometimes, we say, we empower them. Which means that they were not empowered before, mm. right? And because of that, um, when you're in national workshops or some things like, oh, okay, CSO comes along because they're part of the empowerment or capacity building process. That, you know, if we reorient it and say, no, actually, they're contributing. They're playing a contributory role to what we, in a national level, and INGOs are doing. Because, you know, they have this skill set. And I know it's a little bit threatening for, you know, if you're an INGO and you've been developing for a long time, you know, and you have, you have a lot of big cars and whatever, right? It's like, ah, oh, shit, that means we're, you know, sorry for the language, that means we, 
we are, we're working ourselves out of, out of a job. But, but wouldn't that be great? Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's, and, and you know, I have meetings where people say, well, you know, that approach, that, that means you, uh, you make yourself, uh, you know, obsolete. I say, no, actually, no, because the interesting thing about human evolution, because I'm a biologist at human, you know, training a long time ago, is that we evolve. So, INGOs is we need to also evolve in how we work and the approach that we do. And if at one point the CSO don't think of us as worthy partners, well, that says something about us. So, uh, so in, in a way, we stop using the word empowerment, but instead like, we try to mobilize. Thank you so much for all your uh, sharing experiences on this topic. And I completely agree with the notion on common, common name as well as uh, bringing this participatory into a different level. But I'm curious, maybe this is a, a naughty question. Does this notion have limitations? I'm referring to issues that already mentioned by others about we also deal with climate change, something big beyond community, something unsolvable for the community. Um, do you think this, based on your reflection, do you think this also has limitations? You know, it's common because it's very small scale, it's very limited, it's a very territoriality. It's, whereas the, the, the problem that we face now, currently, is really like huge, and that's really beyond, uh, beyond this community. Just curious what you thought on this. Thank you. There was a question from Professor Amalinda Sabirani <laughs> from uh, UGM, Universitat Gajah Mada in uh, Indonesia. Okay, thank you. So uh, I've been uh, dealing with the uh, research about risk perception of hazards. And in terms of this one, we perceive hazards in a many different scale, right? We have like uh, hazards that on uh, maybe in a local scale, on the regional scale, and also like climate change is on the global scale. And if you look hazards at the local scale, you can see that sometimes the government play a really big role in that. But in the case of climate change, there is no super government, like because uh, we are dealing in the global level. So uh, we have countries with authorities with their own. Uh, rules and regulations that has to uh, again co uh, collaborate together to, to deal with this climate change issue and the uh, uh, issue at this scale we have successfully managed to solve that before in the case of ozone hole with the montreal protocol so that's one of the success example of how uh, a problem in that global scale at least can be uh, uh, dealt together tackled together so yeah because there is no super government that uh, can impose their regulations to the country. So the only thing that if we have to find a way to uh, cooperate, and of course uh, the issue of climate change is something that is quite different. If we talk about something that happens in the uh, local scale and regional scale, in terms of immediateness of the impact, and the, and and the, uh, you know uh, because we don't feel it at the moment. So uh, what is it rational to Invest the resource to to stop the global warming at 1.5 degree, as we mentioned before. But again, it's uh, you know it's a uh, really a different interest between saving uh, now and also saving the next generations. Thank you. I'll just make the comment about um, we think that little actions don't mean anything. We need to remember constantly that it is all those little actions cumulatively that do create a big change. And every little thing we can do can help. And I know it's, it, it, it seems arbitrary, um, in a sense, to talk about the work that we do on water in the community when you're thinking about this you know, global comments of, of the climate and of the direction that we're heading. Uh, but you just, I, yeah, I do, I do a fair amount of work on the climate side of things uh, and also do teach this course that addresses this exact issue. So I just say, like, look, every little thing counts, and we just got to do the little things and and fight the good fight um, because I think that's really the only way. 
Is there any uh, last question or yeah, comments? Last comment. Yeah. Me, <coughs> I, I, I do work with the aid agency USAID. I go around um, Africa and lots of places. And I'm doing a project now in Nepal. And I was there last May. To, I, I do work with beekeeping and pollination and whatever. And it, I had to do an assessment of the beekeeping pollination industry in Nepal. It's very hard at the grassroots level to find out what's happening. I agree you should empower um, the, the, the workers, people, but they don't understand the wider issues, you know, and that's fair enough. But it, working through a second language, particularly, it's very hard to get information on the correct information out of them. You could ask a question and they'd tell you yes or no, but that wasn't the right question. But they wouldn't tell you that. You know, it's, it's, ve it's very hard working in developing countries for a Westerner to sort out what's happening and make advice. And in Nepal, at least, um, the government aren't taking my advice, which I think is incorrect. That's my opinion. But um, when you get top-down people making decisions that, are, that I think are the quickest, there are quicker solutions in other areas. Just a comment on this. Uh, okay. Okay. So I would like to provide you the opportunity to make uh, to do a light, last collection, and if not, we can. Uh, it's already eight, so we can we can close, I guess. So please uh, applause our uh, invites. <laughs>